Good afternoon. Welcome to the June 21st. It's my dear I'd like to thank Dr. Choi and Charles Curran for being our greeters today. Uh, Eric Marcus for being secretary, Ticketmaster, um, other other stuff. Uh, thanks to that hand worker for the setup. And uh, thanks to our program uh, committee, Steve Bales, Mark Weinstein, and Mike Swift for the great things of the um, thanks to Jim Gundo for keeping up our website. To ask any driver to come forward for notification. Right. Well, good afternoon. Would you please join me in prayer? Mm -hmm. The Holy Creator of Gilbus. An international time of peace on earth and goodwill towards men. Inspired by our great leaders and philosophers who themselves were inspired by you. We ask you to guide those as our government leaders make their daily decisions that affect us so that their efforts, whether international or local, may be motiv motivated by that same great rule, charity and goodwill. Thank you. Oh, Eric, do you have a secretary's report for us? I will leave my mic. Uh, I think I had seven, yes, but one was the speaker, I don't think. So, uh, Brian Lampton has an unusual guest in the seat of the chair. Eric. Thank you, <laughs> And who's not here, Shannon Grant, has this two usual guests. Uh, uh, and it's welcome. Abby. And let's see, Jack Henderson has two guests. Jack, Jack is out getting for his guests. <laughs> he has to remember Jim's daughter and strength. Courtney H. I couldn't remember the hyphenated last name. <laughs> and Sophie, his grand granddaughter. They're out there getting food. Um, yeah, I know. I think. <laughs> Alice has a guess. So uh, my guess is Jody Martin. I think many of you know Jody. She is the uh, president of the Bellbrook Sugar Creek Chamber. Yes. She also works at the Miami Valley Communications Council. And I have some pamphlets. They are doing veteran stories over there. And I know we have a lot of vets here, and every vet has a story. Uh, and if you're willing to uh, record those stories, uh, please come and get this and look at it and pass it around. Uh, but I think what they, what Jody's most famous for is she's a granddaughter of Pee Wee Martin, our a famous World War II uh, vet who just passed away a couple of years ago. And as a matter of fact, she went to Normandy two weeks ago with her two sons and stood on the same beach that he jumped in. Wow. All right, welcome. Okay, and I do the total. We have seven guests, 26 Rotarians for 53.5%. Not bad for a 95 degree. <laughs> yeah. All right. Professor Nair says, Sergeant at Arms, come on down. Good afternoon. Oh, great. By the way, Rick and Julie and I just came from the Nourish the Service activity out here at Hope Hotel. It goes out until 3 o'clock today. If you want to go out there and help her out and do that, uh, we've got fish pantry from Xenia and Fairborn there. And I think Home Depot's there and giving away gifts for uh, our service people. Today is June 21st, 2014. It's the 173rd day of the year. There's 193 days left. It's also the first cold day of summer. Judging from the temperature, that probably happened a week ago. Mm -hmm. but, um, and there's only 93 days until fall and football. <laughs> Today we're celebrating. Most of you in here are going to celebrate this day. Baby Boomers Recognition Day. It was skateboarding day. Combine those two and we'll see what happens at the last ten minutes. Is that an international t-shirt day? National dog party day. National flip-flop day. 
And Rick, this is for you, National Selfie Day. Plus two weeks. I don't know. It's Tim Bank Lunch Break Day. Take your dog to work day. I'll see you later. Put the dog in. And it's also Ugliest Dog Day. And World Handshake Day. So I'm hoping our readers took advantage of that because they did that. Also, this week we celebrated Amateur Radio Week, Carpenter Ant Awareness Week. How much day? 100 days. Happened right after the play day for the first uh, 21 days after that. National Forgiveness Week. National Play Catch Week. Oh, Universal Fathers Week. And something else we probably all have to deal with, Wobbly Week. A little wobbly when we get out. Things that happened on this day in history. 1675, the foundation stone for St. Paul's Cathedral, one of the largest famous ones in the world, was laid about in London. 1788, the U.S. Constitution went into effect when New Hampshire was the ninth state to ratify it. In 1853, the envelope holding machine patented by Russell Hawes was announced in Worcester, Worcester, I'm sorry, I can try to call it like it looks like it's not Massachusetts. And for those of us who had to send mass failings out, that's a good thing, the holding machine. It's 1879. Uh, it was great. Five cents to open North Queen Street, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. In 1893, the first Ferris wheel opened in the Columbia Exposition in Chicago, Illinois. Can you imagine being the first one to get on a Ferris wheel? <laughs> Having no idea what there is. Wow. In 1989, the Supreme Court ruled it was okay to burn the U.S. flag as a political expression. In 1990, the U.S. House of Representatives voted 254 to 177 to stop it. The U.S. flag burning, but it didn't pass. In our uh, this week, uh, we had a couple of birthdays. Yeah. Ryan Jarvis had a birthday on Wednesday's day. Right? Well, actually, it's coming up. Smoking okay, that's that's the thing. Yes, right. Well, it's a honestly, it's almost small. Ryan, who did have a birthday? We go up sixteen. Uh, member anniversary recap uh, five years in the club and the anniversary of Ron Fulker and his wife Lyric, uh, five years. To do that plus, that's what it said in there. So, I said, I could say, Roger is never wrong. <laughs> and look at that, and I said, I'm not sure. It seems like fun. Yeah. Scientists have studied the ideal amount of time to dunk an Oreo in milk. The milk companies go together like peanut butter and jelly and salt and pepper. However, there is a right way and a wrong way to dunk a cookie in milk, according to scientists. During the test, the Oreo soaked up 50% of its potential liquid in one second. That number shot up to 80% in two seconds. Flatlined in three seconds and maxed out at four seconds, meaning the cookie could absorb no more milk. So, if the goal was to saturate the cookie, the perfect number to dunk an Oreo is three seconds. Huh. It's amazing to be able to do research, isn't it? Oh, you got a little slide. You have a lot of projects. This is A couple of facts about Oreos since we're talking about Oreos. They were sprayed in a New York City bakery and sold in a tin, 30 cents a pound. Jeez. It remains a mystery exactly why the cookies are named Oreos. But they were created with the British in mind, and they initially were called Oreo biscuits. They are the best selling cookie in the world. <laughs> One six pack of Oreos contains 270 calories. Hence, there are 40 calories in one cookie. Now, if you're doing the most popular commercial cookie product in the United States, the name Oreo is derived from a word 
and was trademarked in 1921. And close to 500 billion Oreos have been sold since their introduction in 1912. And also for you guys who like the dull stuff, the percentage of grape belly and adult stuff Oreo compared to the original is 186% more. So that's a little bit more than $45. Not the lower it's not. If it's true. Why not? 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 <laughs> my wife is so mad at me. She says I have no sense of direction. So I packed all my bags and write. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> I'll give her that. <laughs> yeah, they still don't get it. <laughs> I know that. It's just a final one on. But then we have to explain it. It's just not worth it. It's just time to move on. I took my son to the cleaners. And they want to charge me $40 for me to clean. So instead, I gave it to the charity shop next door. So they cleaned it, pressed it, and put it in the window. I bought it back for $15. <laughs> 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 well, I've I decided I'd never go to bed angry. We've been away since Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> and someone on the way here gave me half of each side. That's weird. That is weird. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, we talked to my wife, and she said uh, she said she missed me. Normally, that'd be a good thing, but she was reloading. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in elementary school, I have to pre-read these because some of them aren't really great. But <laughs> when I was in elementary school, we learned about a shape called a rhombus. That was the last time I ever heard about such a shape. Why can't you let a politician on a plane? Because he'll keep, he'll keep trying to destroy the other wing. There was a priest, a politician, and a clown walked into a bar. And the bartender said, What is this? Some kind of joke? A politician running for office was asked about his policy on liquor. He answered, if you mean the demon drink that poisons the body, ruins the mind, and destroys the family and creates criminals, then I'm against it. But if you mean the beautiful drink used for wedding toast, the foundation of fun Friday night, and the biggest source of tax revenue to fund needy orphans, then I'm for it. And I won't change my mind no matter what you say. <laughs> well, the bishops can find an excuse to get out of anything except office. <laughs> or your poor self. The opposite or the opposite of the crow is con. So the opposite of progress is Congress. <laughs> and then what's the difference between death and taxes? Congress doesn't need everyone to make death worse. <laughs> I did these in honor of our speaker, didn't they? So <laughs> Politics is supposed to be the second oldest profession. I've come to realize that there is, there is a very close resemblance to the first. <laughs> and then, as always, I'd like to leave you with a couple of positive quotes. If you're always trying to be normal, you will never know what amazing can be. And doubt kills more dreams than Bayer ever will. Today's clients. If you're a baby boomer, that's a dollar. If you've ever taken a selfie, that's a dollar. If you have a dog, that's a dollar. If you've ever been on a roller coaster, that's a dollar. If you've ever eaten a royal cookie, that's a dollar. And if you're not wearing your rotary gun, that's a dollar.
I think this probably might be my last day doing this. So I needed to make sure we got as much money as we could. Thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. 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 I can't answer it's on the top. Sorry. Oh, shit. Brian, uh, Karen and I celebrate our one year anniversary. I have three cents. All right. Another half of us. Oh, all right. Um, any announcements? Okay, I got a couple of announcements. So, um, the first, uh, our Bikes for Heroes um, for Independence Day um, at the Beaver Creek High School. It'll be installation at two o'clock on June 29th, which is Saturday, and then removing them on July 6th, which is Sunday? Saturday. That's also Saturday. Saturday. Okay. Okay. Add two, both of those are, events are at 2 p.m. If you can lend a hand, it makes it easy. We would appreciate it. Um, and then also, kind of a reannouncement. Um, if you want to announce the event, so everybody should have received an invitation. Um, today at four o'clock, we will be uh, dedicating the Beaver Creek Community Library to Carol Grass uh, in partnership with the Beaver Creek Township Trustees. Uh, so we hope to see all of you there. Parking is limited. Um, so off the street parking, um, any of the other businesses around there, uh, okay. try to park there. It will be a very brief ceremony out front of the library, ribbon cutting, and then I will have our Just Any other announcements? Okay. So our ticket drawing, recall that our, uh, that half of the proceeds go to our Christmas basket project with the chance to draw from Queen of Hearts. You will need negative number 339 775. Oh, yeah, I sold myself a winning ticket. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so I would like to uh, welcome our own um, representative Brian Lampton to introduce our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you. It's my honor and privilege to introduce our friend, State Senator Bob Hackett. Uh, Bob represents Clark, Green, and Clinton counties. He lives, however, in Madison County. So the lines got redrawn. He no longer represents where he lives. And so he's, he has, he actually has a senator. <laughs> That's yeah, no, it's kind of funny, actually. Um, the Bob's a, a financial services business owner. He's licensed, been licensed in both property and casualty and life and health. He's formerly a county commissioner and state rep. Um, Bob currently serves as the chair of the Senate Insurance Committee. He's also on the Health Committee, Financial Institution Committee, and Transportation. I don't know how you got that one. Uh, but he's also a member of the Rules and Reference Committee. And the, those of you that know, that's the committee that steers everything to two committees and back to the floor and all that. So he has a very strong leadership role in that, in that committee in that capacity. Um, he's very well respected in the Senate by both parties, and um, it was sad to say that he is currently serving his last year. Uh, he is term limited, so Bob, is, we're going to miss you, and the Senate's going to miss you, and our district and your Senate folks, we're gonna, they're going to miss him. He's also a very strong representative in NCOIL, which is the National Coalition of Insurance Legislators, and um, uh, he's been involved with that probably 16, 18 years or however long you've been doing it. 
And that organization um, drafts model legislation for mostly insurance related items. And you've probably been a part of many model legislative activities over the over the years. <laughs> so uh, please warm rotary welcome for our friend, Senator Bob Hackett. <laughs> The good news is this probably be my last time that I'll speak before you. So that is that is good. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, about a week ago, I saw two uh, people from Rotary were talking, and somehow the speaker didn't show up at your last meeting. And I went, "Oh my God! I hope I didn't put the wrong thing." <laughs> so I that night. I was I would have called Mike at home. Mike, I'm so sorry, but when I had the right date, <laughs> the office said, and so it wasn't me, thank goodness. Uh, I'm going to talk a little today about, you know, we did we did have monies this year, and so I'm going to talk a little uh, a bit about uh, how those monies were spent in, in my counties, and, and we did really well in my counties. I, I had built a real good rec uh, relationship with uh, our, uh, and he ran for U.S. Senate, but uh uh, Matt Dolan does, does a super job. He's been a, a, a the chairman of both all the budgets for us for a long time. And then Ray DeRossi is our policy guy, and then Ray does a really good job. And Ray knows the insides and admirals. I remember one time, wasn't it? It was in Madison where Tolls, uh, the, the new director at Tolls, got into an argument with Ray. And I said to her, I said, you know, there's a famous expression you can win the battle, but lose the war. And and she did. She thought that they, she did not want to make Columbus, Columbus State would be like Clark State. Uh, Columbus State would come in and be the fiscal officer under that. And I said, I guarantee they won't come in and take over your program. I guarantee it. You know, Dave Harrison's good buddy and he won't do it under that scenario unless we want him to do it. And then you want him to do it. But she wouldn't change. And then she didn't qualify. She thought she did. And she kept fighting with them, et cetera. But the next guy did a great job, and he has gotten monies two times ago, and he got monies this last time. And I got him to work in Columbus because that's where Columbus 2020 is, and Columbus has a lot more money than Madison County. And our tolls, our career center is Madison, Hilliard, and Dublin, so it's really good. I mean, and Hilliard and Dublin, as everybody knows, has got a lot of money, as you can get. Uh, one thing is, uh, and just to explain the, the basic, I mean, how we work, Next week is going to be our last week before summer. And actually, the, we won't meet again until after the election in November. So from in that period, from after uh, the election in November to the end of the year, we call it lame duck. And hopefully, at times, we get a lot done in lame duck, and it's a really involved process. Uh, don't know. Don't know what we're going to get done, et cetera. Uh, I had to speak to the Farm Bureau and I had to speak a little last night to uh, the Green County, or not Green County, but the Clinton County Township Association. And one of the things that they, yeah, I tell people it's, it's a strange time. I'm, I'm just looking at my comments from last night, but, you know, the president of the Senate is term limited like with me. And he's going to go over, and that's not really unusual. I mean, not, not unusual at all. That happens a lot where the person will leave the Senate and they'll go back and run in the House. What is really unusual is the president of the Senate is not only going over and running unopposed, but he's also working very hard to be elected as Speaker of the House. And he's running against the current Speaker that has a couple terms left. And so the House and the Senate aren't getting along. And that's probably the main reason is you can't blame the Speaker too much because your opposition, you know, he wants to take your job. So it's really a strange time. You know, we haven't got a lot done. I mean, because uh, Brian and I, we, we didn't like Hal Solder at all. And Hal Solder was pay to play. It was unbelievable. You know, he, he didn't think any rules applied to him on that scenario. But Hal Solder, uh, since Hal Solder left, we still haven't got a lot accomplished. A lot of the Senate bills are sitting, and Brian will tell you, under the line. Where this, and I can't blame the Speaker, but the Speaker doesn't want them you know, any credit to go to the president of the Senate. So who knows what's going to happen. Uh, we did get, the, they did the community fund about three, four months ago, and I was putting the word out, no way we'll accept that because it, Brian, I'll tell you, it's very political. You know, there were three, three caucuses and two were Republican 
and the one Republican caucus didn't support the speaker, and they didn't get any money. I mean, it was really a political. I've never seen a Republican uh, elected official not get monies either in the capital budget or a community fund under that scenario. But this time happened. Well, we went ahead and approved it. We're going to vote it out of the House, but both the House, we voted out of the House and Senate this next week. But they have agreed. You know, the House has agreed we're going to do. And our president has agreed that what we take from the House is about 95% of, of what they want. And that surprised me because I thought we'd throw the whole thing back to them and say, do something that's not as political and that everybody gets some money from it. But they'll tell you, like Bill Dean didn't get any monies. Uh, my state rep from Springfield got very, very little monies. Brian does a really good job of working with both sides. And so Brian, you know, Brian did okay. He did. I mean, in Green County, he did so much. I, I tell people, remember, there were two budgets. There was a regular capital budget. And then there was a community fund, and they, we called community fund. It was the OTSCIF, and it was the one-time skip funds, is what we would say. And they were funds that basically it was seven hundred million, and the House was to get three fifty approved by the Senate, and the Senate was to get three fifty approved by the House. And uh, we've got it approved. I remember when we got. We did it like over the last couple of weeks in the Senate, and they said, go ahead and do a press conference. And I, I didn't do it right away. I said, how do we know the House approves? Because I'm not going to do a press conference, you know, send out a press release, and then have, it really backfired on some House members that had elected officials that were running for races in the primary. You know, they couldn't guarantee that these this would, would go. And there's a couple of people that now probably wish they would have stayed strong on it because they ended up getting monies that they didn't think they were going to get. Uh, Green County, just to let you know, Green County got, and I'll show you what it is. It is let me, I got to grab. The, here it is. Green County got, uh, Wright Pack got, and we called it the Future Development of Wright Pack. We got two, two and a half million dollars through me. And then we got another million and a half through Montgomery County, and they put it in through the Senate. And we used prep. We didn't have a lot of representatives, so we actually put it in just to the Senate. And really, you know, I get the credit for that. So that's four million. We got a million from the House for the future development of Wright Pack. So there was, so that means five million dollars is going towards Wright Pack. There's a million for the Fairborn Skyway Skip Center. And I worked hard on that. Brian worked real hard. There was a million for the Spring House Park, phase one. Uh, I got half a million for our Wright State, the archives upgrade. And they've been trying to get that, and Brian will tell you, for a while. So we got uh, there. Uh, there were three little ones that, that came in during the house project. And I don't know, Brian, if the house got them, if you were responsible or if Bill Dean did get 175 went to Ohio's Means Jobs through Beth Rubin. And I was following it because I want to make sure I let them know when it got through on that scenario. And then another 150,000 went to the Ohio Veterans Children's Home Expansion. That's where Athletes in Action is. So there went there. And then uh, I got a million dollars for Central State. Now, Central State got its normal three and a half million. And on top of that, Several states wants to start a new college of health and uh, allied health and human services. They wanted a lot more than the million under that scenario. So uh, actually, Chris Widener represents them. They weren't super happy. I saw uh, a joint. No, who did I see? I saw the former lady that's a, the uh, the uh, Congress lady from Joyce Beatty from Columbus, and she graduated from Central State, and she. Really tried. We tried to get three million. That was my request to get three million, but we weren't able to do it. There just wasn't enough money. So the total, of the Senate all together, we got. Oh, when you include the million and a half from Montgomery County in my name, we got eight point eight million on that scenario, and the Senate got uh, all together 
about five, six million, and then the house got the remainder part. Total house was two million three hundred twenty-five thousand. So yeah, I got between six and seven million. So we did we did okay. You know, we, we did okay on that scenario. I want to tell people to also to we'll go into lame duck, and that's when hopefully we'll get some stuff done. We may or may not, because the real key vote is the first Tuesday, and that's what I was telling the judge. The first Tuesday in January, I'll be gone. But that's where they vote for the speaker. And that is a real key vote. If Huffman wins, uh, we'll probably get a lot done and more done in the future because his predecessor in the Senate is his right arm, is Rob McCauley. And Rob doesn't have any opposition, you know, at all for that. So Rob will get elected uh, president of the Senate this next time. And so you'll have two guys that are very close. One one would be would be Speaker of the House, and the other would be President of the Senate. A lot and and really strong Republicans, and a lot should be done. If Jason gets it, I think it'll work better. I do. I think Jason won't worry about getting reelected. Jason has to deal with once again. He's got two Republican caucuses. Brian can talk better about that, but but they don't all they don't always get along. And a lot of times, one caucus is strongly against the other caucus. They try to, uh, the Tea Party uh, try to uh, to censure the, 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 the 22 Republicans that voted for Jason. And I think in Greene County they did, and I think in Clark they did. But they came in mass, and I wouldn't even win the Senate. And they called me, the Central Committee called me to come in the middle of their meeting. And they said, what do you think? And I just said, Householder got elected with 26 Republicans and 26 Democrats. I mean, you didn't hear a peep out of the, the far right group. Not even that, because number one, they supported Householder. And number two, Householder, I mean, he would have taken them apart if you went a Householder really wielded a club. You know, I mean, I was one of the few that just didn't like Householder and spoke against him, but he but I was in the Senate and he was in the House. I don't know if I would have done that because he would have made life miserable for me in the House. And, I wouldn't have been on it. any committees or very few committees. I sure would have been chairman of, a, of insurance, even though I was real successful at doing that. Uh, but just to let people know is that if if the bills don't pass by year end, Brian will take you start all over. Think about that. So that means if you've had a bill and it's worked hard and it's passed by the Senate and wait for the House, if it doesn't get passed by the year end and signed by the governor, you've got to start all over. So that means you got to drop the bill. It's got to go through the committee process. And then let's say first in the Senate, if it goes in the Senate first or first in the House, then it goes to the opposite body. And then if they don't agree, it goes to conference committee. And it, it can really take a good while under that. I wasn't always against the governor doing things administratively. A lot of leadership says we're the ones who should make the law. The governor shouldn't do it. But the problem about administrative, I mean, the, the plus about administrative rules changes, you can change it a lot easier than change. The only way to change the law, Charles will tell you, is to do another bill. That's the only way to change it. Then you got to go through all the process. So sometimes we don't get it right the first time, and we know that when, when the bill is dropped. We're not sure how, if this is the way to do it, but we're going to start doing it this way, and then we're going to see how that works. If it doesn't work quite right, we'll change it. A perfect example of that was, and I don't know if Brian knows this, but we had a bill because of you. Everybody knows the train wreck that happened in East of Palestine, and the the Senate reacted really quickly that that we said, "Hey, you, now you have to have these monitors, you have to have all this stuff." And but the Senate didn't know. I didn't know. No one really knew. There's three processes or three layers of of rail things. And the top layer is the one that does a lot of volume, but there's a lot of small ones that are mid-sized and then really small size. There is really no way they can have, you know, we had to treat each one differently. And so we went ahead and fixed the bill. After we passed the bill and it got passed by the House, we went ahead and fixed it in the House, went ahead and accepted and agreed with us on that. So sometimes we just don't know. We really don't know how what the fix is and how we could fix it. Last night, they had the, uh, at the chamber, the, at the uh, 
a township association and they had a speaker, it's Heidi Fowler. And Heidi and I are good buddies. And she was she was second command of the township when I started 20 some years ago. And I, I worked really hard when the older person retired that she got the top position. She was really good. And she, you know, they have a omnibus bill. And a lot of times they'll they'll have instead of having five or six or seven bills, they'll have one large bill with all these different sections of the bill. Then they're tied together because they're township bill. But they're, I mean, some of them are really, really things like there's something in the high revised code that's wrong. That needs it's a technical change, needs to be fixed. So there's a lot of these bills. And she's upset that it hasn't passed yet. But nothing has passed. Very little. Brian will tell you. Other than road namings and <laughs> right? Brian, Brian will tell you, not a lot have been passed. Even we've got some insurance bills passed, but it's it was like pulling teeth trying to get it through under that. And we said, look, we're not taking a side on who's running for speaker. We just want to this will help Ohio help the, get things passed. So that's basically what we did. Uh, a lot of people talk today, when I talked and the questions they asked in Clark, was the Farm Bureau, was on solar. And my district is really strange in that all three of the counties reacted differently. Green County hates solar. And so I remember saying to Mike DeWine, I said, Mike, I think the majority of the people in your township, they're going to, they're, they're, like, I think I said 75, 80% would be really against solar. You know what the governor said? He says, Bobby, I think it's 100%. <laughs> oh, yeah. So he knows how, I mean, you remember we've seen all the signs, no solar, no solar. Uh, Madison County, the commissioners opened, it, opened arms initially, and I thought they made a big mistake. I called them. They, what they did was they said any area outside of London, the city, and the three villages, which was John, which was Plain City, Mount Sterling, and West Jeff, uh, they they would be okay for solar development. And I called them the next day. I said, "You lost your mind. You don't. I mean, you have every solar company in the world coming to this county." I said, "Just designate if you want some designate an area." Solar is really good for the schools, and it's really good for the county because of the tax revenues that comes into play. But there are some downsides of solar, as you see under that scenario. And, and uh, Mass and County, the commissioners took a lot of flack, and they flipped, they flipped back and said, you guys, you farmers are right. We don't want it. And, and the State Farm Bureau didn't really come out against it because there were some farmers that wanted it because they were selling their land. The solar companies, and they think they should have the right to sell their land. So Farm Bureau, very strong lobbying group, said, hey, we don't know how to handle this under that scenario. But what Madison did, and now everybody else, a lot have adopted it, you'll see the signs, no prime farmland. So they just say, hey, if the land is really good farmland, it shouldn't be there for solar. So you'll see these signs all over the state now, and it says no prime land. And that's what the uh, the uh, state organization of Farm Bureau did. They basically said, okay, we'll pass that. Even though we were against getting in the middle of the picture, uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and do that under that scenario. And so Clark County did it a little differently. Clark basically left it up to the townships. We had a bill, and actually it was McCauley who's going to be president of the Senate. Brian, I'll tell you, sometimes you work a little different on a bill. We had a bill that we knew was going to pass. And they wanted to give one township, a single township, the ability to have a township referendum. I thought that was the dumbest thing in the world because we would have fracking. You get, you know, some of these townships, there's just no way they, they want any change at all. And so there's just no way that they would approve under that. And I said, we can't do that. So it was my suggestion because uh, Rob said, well, we just want to mirror the states around us. And I said, Indiana would never give the townships the ability. They gave the ability to the county commission. So we changed the bill. And that's what went, Senate Bill 52, that went over to the House, which they approved. It was the commissioners went ahead. Well, Clark County commissioners left it up to each individual township. And there's 10 townships in Clark. 
six are okay with uh, solar company. And I just said, you can change. A lot of counties have changed because you didn't know. So if you think that's wrong, get together the three of you and say, we want to shut it down. So I would say the majority of the counties now have shut it down, have done what Green County has done. And Madison has shut it down after three have been finished. And there's a fourth, the largest one in Ohio, is, is being is grandfathered because they it took so long, it was so big that but was when they went before the uh the siding board, it was way before Senate Bill 52. It went way before, but it was before it. And so they had already got it on record that they were requesting approval, which is what the law says that would make them grandfathered. So stay tuned. We don't know what's going to happen. Uh the, the power siding board has approved it. But they've allowed an appeal in Madison County now was appealed in, so we'll see what happens under that scenario. Uh, but that's what it is. I don't think we're going to have a lot of, of work done. I mean, Brian, I don't know if you think there's going to be a lot, but we uh, uh, next week we're they're going to meet and we're going to meet. But the major reason is get these two budgets out and all this money that we spent, and we spent a lot of good money. And and in the Senate they did a great job. Of listening to me, so that was great. So Dole, I give Dolan and uh, and Ray Rossi great uh, 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 plus because they really listened to me. That's it. Clinton County. Think about this. I represent Clinton now. Clinton got more money, and there was not a dime from the house. We got almost five million from, for Clinton County, and uh, they got more money in that in this capital budget community fund than they have and the total in the last 10 years, if you total everything they got, I think if they, they'd probably go back 20 years. Clinton's a lot like Madison, they're a small county, and Clark and Green would get a little more of, of, the, of, the, of the deal. So but so I'll open up to questions. Anybody has any questions about it? Yes, sir. I, I kind of miss what's going on with the solar thing, because okay, you would think that utility scale solar is a good, clean way to create energy. You mentioned that it increases the tax base exponentially because farmland has tax reductions and a, a, a farmland being used for solar would have regular price for the land and taxes, correct? It's clean. And, you know, a farmer can grow soybeans, a farmer can grow corn, Right, uh, or beets, or whatever, or they, or they can grow sunshine. So they're using their land for what they want. Why are we so against it? Well, I man, that's a good question. It, it it really is taking production, taking farmland out of production. But doesn't that help the farmers by raising the price of the good of the, of what they're growing because there's less of it now? Well. And I don't disagree with that when I grew up. I mean, we would pay farmers to do that. But right now, we don't have enough. I mean, I'm a free market guy, but I'm not a totally free market guy. Uh, when I went to school at Columbia, uh, Milton Friedman was a professor at uh, University of Chicago, and he was, a, he was like the guru of free market. And what Milton Friedman said was, and he never was 100% right. No one's ever 100% right. And what he said was basically each country and what they do the best, and then we should work better together with countries. We we did that in oil, and ask anybody in the room what happened when we, you know, relied on the Middle East to do oil. They screwed us so badly. They set prices so badly. I mean, everything was to maximize. We won't let that being done in food. You will never see another country coming in and saying, "Hey, they're going to feed." You know, they're going to. Rely on them to help feed our people. So, so that's the first question. Second question: When you look at solar on that scenario, it, it's okay. And I, and a lot of the things in the bill I worked really hard for. So when you see the lease of the of the an, of of the land, what happens if it doesn't work out? Well, I made sure that they had to get an insurance. Or they had to put up cash. They have to post a bond, don't they? Yeah, they can post a bond. They can do that. Or they can buy insurance. Buy the bond under that scenario, on that situation. 
But that still doesn't totally, I mean, the, the argument says, well, it doesn't still totally deal with inflation because you're doing something now that could come across in 20 years, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, you, you're right into the point, but the, here's the major reason I, the reason solar is so, it looks to be successful, you know, and you should know this, you know what the reason is? Because we give them such great, you know, we give them such great tax credits. Yeah, sure. And we can't, I, I don't disagree in, a, in starting an industry and giving them tax credits, but I sure the hell disagree that we continue the tax credits forever. No, if I, they agree can't that, I agree completely. Unsubsidized solar now on the utility scale is cheaper than unsubsidized gas or oil, coal fire. Yeah, and, and it is, definitely I agree with you. It is on that. But, you know, a lot depends on, it, it can be cheaper now, it can be cheaper there. And the only reason it's cheaper now is because we subsidize. No, it. Unsubsidized is cheap. Yeah, but we subsidize it now. But you tell me a solar company that doesn't get tax credits in Ohio. There isn't one. Tax credits. Well, that's what we hope to do. But we want to make sure an industry works out. And see, the concept is: Will the solar work 100 percent of the time? Well, let's... well, you know what you should say. The answer to that is: When when you have days like today and you create a lot of quality solar, it goes into the batteries. So it's a combination of solars and batteries. So when you don't, when the solar is not working, the batteries are. So that's why in a situation like that. So I didn't really make a statement whether it's for or against solar. I left it up to the locals to decide what it is on that scenario. So we'll, you know, we'll wait and see. Yeah. But I sure the hell, we don't need to be, you know, incentivizing them forever. Under that scenario, I that yeah yes sir. What's the, what's the status of the marijuana? Yeah, the uh, recreational. Uh... Yeah, I mean it was approved, and so okay. My wife, you talk. I have a brother who's a doctor and, and wife. They will tell you that marijuana is not the choice of medication for really any condition, with the exception of pain. With the exception of something that they just the people feel better, but it doesn't really correct the situation. So there, so marijuana, you you can talk to anybody in the medical field, the AMA and the CDC, they'll tell you that marijuana is just there to help people get through some tough times and different things, et cetera. But, so that's why. So, uh, you know, time will say the law passed. A lot of the business club that I belong in Columbus, they supported marijuana. And I said, you, know, you guys are strong Republicans. Why would you support that? You know why they did? Because they said they wanted the state involved. They worry about maybe themselves, but they worry more about their friends who smoke marijuana, that they want to make sure that the state checks it out first and it's not laced with fentanyl under that scenario. And when it goes through the, through the state of Ohio, they will check it out under that scenario. So that's why I mean, so many business people Voted for marijuana. It surprised me because I thought the marijuana, it might pass, but it would be because of the other. We went too far on it. And I agree with that. But that's why. I mean, so so it's just a work in progress. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. So uh, in the aftermath of all the federal funds coming into the jurisdictions, Great in question. Ohio, how has that impacted the way that the legislature works and funding? And what do you see as the impact of those local communities? Yeah, so you know, we have some radical right people that weren't real crazy about taking those federal dollars as they were coming down. And I would say this, it's a sh and I say this as an investment advisor, I'd say, it's a short run, uh, short run solutions could create major, major long run problems, and because of the debt. But the problem I would say is we don't, you know, we didn't control Washington at the time, and because of that, if we didn't spend the money, it would go to New York, Illinois, uh, uh, California, very democratic states. They would use it, and you would still have to pay it back. That's the thing that people didn't realize. They were just writing monies that they didn't have, and they just were creating the debt, this greater debt. Will we have problems in the long run? We could easily. I mean, there, there's a lot of studies out 
We have 30 some trillion now. They projected to go to 50 some trillion within a couple of years. And so I don't know under that scenario, but that's a great question because most of the far right people said, hey, you know, if we don't use it, other states will that are democratic and we'll still have to pay it back. So that's why I said, you know, it's probably a good a, a scenario that I wasn't speaking against it, but it was a short run solution that can create major long run problems under that scenario. You know, I changed a little on transportation between the states. You know, we're putting a little more money into years ago, they tried to do it, we beat it down because we'd say, you know, the people came from Chicago or they came from New York. Where do you drop them off in Columbus? There's all these, you drop them off the university, you drop them here. We didn't have a subway system where people could get around our city. So when you saw the systems where it worked, is they had great subways in New York, in Boston, in Chicago. We didn't have really strong subway systems. Not that we're, but we're getting a little better and it's something that we need to do. And so that's why long range and people, people, we're not talking economics, but if you talk economics, when I started 15 to 16 years ago, Ohio was ranked in the middle of the Midwest at best. Now we're the leading state in the Midwest for economic growth. Uh, we're, we're really doing well nationally when you even put all the states in, in, involved in it. So my, the biggest fear of my have is where will we get enough employees to fill the jobs? And then where the hell are they going to live? Green County's done a great job of new starts, a housing start. But I'm going to take you to Madison. Clark's doing better. But Madison's got a long way to go. And Clinton's got a long way to go. People don't realize I got some monies for the uh, air park in, uh, in Clinton County. They have 5,000 employees. 4,000 of the 5,000 live in other counties. So, yeah, I mean, that's the thing. And so Clinton's a lot like Madison. I mean, we had an ag preservation comprehensive plan in Madison. We could get our employees from Columbus and Springfield and still preserve agriculture. We get the tax breaks and, and, and we have countywide zoning. So we had no fights from the townships around the cities. We just annexed the land and they made it off of, as the mayor, the mayor will tell you, they make it off of the city income tax. So it was a win win both for the company coming in and it was their employees that were paying the tax, but they, you know, they got, they had good jobs and that's why they do it. And they came from an area where they were probably paying a city income tax. So that's why under that scenario, but, but now we can't get these boys in Madison. And uh, I mean, in uh, Columbus and Springfield, they're having the problem we are. People don't realize, you guys you realize this, Columbus is a passive growing city in the United States. That's unbelievable. Yeah. So we're doing really well economically. But I work. Yeah. Ohio can't blow this. If they blow it, and I'll be gone. But if they blow it, you know, these companies won't come back. If a company comes and then leaves, they'll never come back. Yeah. Or if they're considering to come. People don't realize there's 56 companies that either have come from the coast, that have come from the coast, or will be coming from the coast, have agreed to come. And those companies will come to me and they'll say, hey, don't worry, we'll move our employees. I want to say, where the hell are they going to live? But I won't say that because I don't want to douse their hope. I'm hoping that we can resolve this. But Clinton County, when I talk to Clinton County, Clinton County will tell you they have that housing problem big time. It's the high-paying jobs. People come from outside the county. It's the low, low-paying jobs is what the Clinton County people get. Now that's changing, but it's got a way to change. Any other questions? That was a great question by economic. That's why. Yes, ma'am. Do you guys know why Columbus is growing so great in the pitch? Sure. 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 Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I think one one of the reasons is High State University is growing. I think our medical industry is really, really strong in Columbus. We have three really good systems, Mount Carmel, OSU and Riverside, uh, Ohio Health. And so, so we have a lot of really good systems, et cetera. Columbus did, and, I, and I'm good friends with the mayor, Columbus did something that I would have, I objected to. I thought he was making a major mistake. They built all these condos and gave them great tax credits to bring the developers in. 
So they built all these condos, and I thought, there is no way they're going to sell all these condos. But they did. A lot of people your age bought condos and put off having kids for a while under that scenario. And they just, and Columbus offers, because they're centrally located, people don't realize a lot of companies come to Ohio because we can, you can get to anywhere. You can get to like 70% of the country within 600 miles, including Canada too, because you got Montreal and, and Toronto in that scenario. So that's one of the reasons why, et cetera, under that thing. I mean, it is true, the big cities are just the nature of the beast. The only way to make them more Democrat is to cut Frank and Kelly Columbus up like 20 times. And we want to keep it as much intact as we can because that's what our Constitution said. So it's it's difficult. And the good Democrats know. I mean, they know that either way. So it's it's more to the victory. To the victor goes the spoils under that scenario. But my, I don't represent my district. And then because it wasn't successful, Brian will tell you that, it's because we wanted to make a couple more counties redistrict and make them more Democratic. So my district, if I had been in it, used to be 59, 41. Now it's like 54. And, and I'm not in it, but it's like 54. It's still Republican, but it's not to what it was. But that's a good question. Any other questions? Thanks, Bob. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As become our custom, we'll donate a uh, book in Senator Hackett's name and honor uh, to the Green County Community Library. This is this is how we do it. One day in the lives of seven kids from around the All right. Uh, do we have any other announcements? Uh, Jack. We missed that introductions today, but I'd like to introduce right. my granddaughter Courtney and my great granddaughter Soul. Email I sent out last week and sign up and go to the dragons. We got till the 30th to sign up. Uh, after that, uh, I'll be thankful. I mean, a lot of people will be fine. Yeah. So far, we've got one party soul that has signed up from the club. Sophie, would you like to say anything? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm putting the pressure on you. Okay. You'll get a word in the world. All right. But you'll all rise with the pledge. Next week's readers are Dave Dunst and Stephanie Cronin. Uh, please keep an eye on upcoming programs at uh, DeaterCreekRotary.com and our social media outlets. And if there's nothing else for the good of the club, uh, Senator Hackley, lead us in the pledge, please. I pledge on the yes. to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic from which it stands. One nation, living your God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you.